Perhaps you've heard of the Buddhist doctrine of the two truths. We're going to try to discuss some of the origins of that doctrine in today's video. I'm Doug Smith of the Online Dharma Institute, that's onlinedharma.org, where you can go to find uh, video courses uh, giving us a deep dive into the Dharma of early Buddhism. If you're new to this channel and interested in living a wiser and a kinder and a calmer life, consider subscribing to this channel and click the bell down below if you want to receive notifications when I come out with new videos. So in today's video what I want to do is give something of an introduction to uh, the history of this concept of two truths. Now what if you aren't familiar with this at all, uh, the very sh quickest, shortest nutshell I can give is that is that in a lot of Buddhist uh, schools there is the idea that there are two truths or two levels to truth if you like. There's a conventional truth that is sort of true for every day and then there is a deeper or should we say ultimate truth uh, which is somewhat different from our conventional understanding of things. Now in this video I'm going to be using uh, the word truth sort of interchangeably with reality and knowledge. These are all um, concepts that sort of tend to run together. Now uh, 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 nitpicking philosophers will tell you there are big differences between them and I would agree with that but we're going to leave those differences aside for this video. Also in today's video I'm going to be dealing with the early origins of this idea, uh, where it came from. Uh, in uh, this video I'll be dealing with stuff that's pre-Buddhist and then we'll get to early Buddhism. Uh, in a, a, a later video, perhaps my next video, um, I will be dealing with the, its later incarnation, the, the, the way that we may have heard of it in, if we've come to the concept in Buddhism generally because we learn the concept from a later idea. And so we'll get to that later on. And I think it goes almost without saying that this is a huge topic and so in today's video and indeed even in today's and the next video uh, I'm only going to be able to touch the surface of it. Uh, so if you know if you are really interested in this uh, there are links to all of the material that I've used, uh, source material and other material in the show notes. Uh, there's of course a lot you can read about this uh, everywhere around. So to begin with we should probably look at what was going around even before the, the time of the Buddha. Uh, there is uh, a number. Of, there are a number of texts called the Upanishads, which were written. Uh, there are a number of them. They were written around the time of the Buddha. It's generally believed that uh, there are a few of them that are pre-Buddhist. That indeed the Buddha himself was, in a sense, responding to. And perhaps the earliest of these is known as the Brihadaranyaka Upanishad. And this text is is quite uh, influential. Uh, in, in India and in the interpretation of the Vedas which we'll get to in a moment. But in any event in that text there is this notion that there is a real, a real uh, world that we see around us uh, that is perishable, that comes and goes, that is changeable, but that there is a, something of what we might term a real behind the real or a truth behind the truth which is unperishable, which is something that is eternal in a sense. We might almost want to say that it's immortal. And in that sense uh, the idea, the part of the religious uh, goal for us in the Upanishads was to come to get to know this immortal truth behind the appearances and so uh, lead immortal lives as it were, become unified with this uh, principle that st stood behind everything known as Brahman. Later on in a different Upanishad known as the Mundaka Upanishad which probably is post-Buddhist but in any event expresses a similar kind of idea. It was around the time of the Buddha, maybe a little bit after. Uh, in this Upanishad we gain this idea uh, which is actually a comparison between the Vedas and the Upanishads. The Vedas are these early, uh, what are known as revealed texts within India that go back several uh, millennia before the Buddha was alive and that sort of uh, influenced all of uh, Indian thought in many ways. The Vedas were in many ways uh, also what the Buddha himself was reacting against. And the Upanishads, what we've just been discussing, are ways that seers around the time of the Buddha, uh, Brahminic seers, attempted to reinterpret these Vedas. 
attempted to gain more knowledge of how to interpret them because the Vedas themselves are, are quite obscure, how we're supposed to understand them. In any event, in this Upanishad, the Mundaka Upanishad, there is made a distinction, uh, essentially a distinction between the Vedas and the Upanishads, if you like, whereby uh, there are two levels of knowledge. The lower level is a knowledge simply of the Vedas themselves, and the higher knowledge is a knowledge, it's said, by which one grasps the unperishable, by which one grasps the eternal or the, uh, the undying. And it's this higher knowledge that one gains through the Upanishads. That's the idea. So in, in this particular text, what we get is this idea of two truths being the lower truth being the Vedas and the higher truth being the interpretation of the Vedas that we get from the Upanishads or this particular Upanishad, if you like. So in this progression, we can see that one of the ways to understand this idea of two truths is that the, the doctrine is a way of getting across the idea that we're reinterpreting something old, that there's a new a group of people coming to the fore who are reinterpreting what is what appears to be true to us now by seeing that there's some deeper reality or deeper truth underneath it. In a sense, we can see it as a kind of almost professionalization, almost uh, an idea that, that we're gaining more knowledge here, and so we're, we're preserving the old ideas as a kind of truth, but we're getting beyond them or beneath them. And we find similar ideas in early Buddhism, and we'll turn to that now. Uh, indeed, as I say, probably the Buddha got some of his ideas from the Upanishadic ideas that were going around while he was uh, learning about the Dharma and, and beginning to teach. And in the Buddha, I should say in the time of the Buddha, the Buddha himself, his ideas were uh, somewhat different, uh, different from what came before, different from what indeed would develop afterwards. That is, this doctrine of two truths can be found in the early Buddhist texts. In a small number of suttas, we find a distinction being made between suttas that require interpretation versus those whose meaning is said to be explicit. In this sense, what we're seeing is that some of the suttas, uh, if you read them uh, straight off, you're going to be misled, whereas other suttas are much more clear and don't require any kind of interpretation to them. And it's said that we should not confuse these two. Now, as I say, there's only a handful of suttas that really make this point, so it certainly is possible that these are later interpolations in some sense, uh, but at least we understand that, that even if they are later interp interpolations, they're getting at something important. And, and what is that? Well, in other texts, the Buddha makes uh, ex more explicit and I think clear kinds of claims here. What he says is that there are certain words that we use, and, and w when we use them, we should understand that we're using, just the, we're using them just as so-called so mere expressions. The Buddha says that these are terms, expressions, and descriptions which one uses without misapprehending them, or that those in the know speak the language of the world without misapprehending it. That is, in a number of different suttas, the Buddha talks about the way that we can speak certain words without really meaning to make a big point about them. Uh, we're not we're, they're true in a manner of speaking, but not in some deeper sense. And what is he talking about here? Well, in all of these cases, what the Buddha is talking about is the idea of the self. That is, the Buddha, in regular speech, talks about himself. He talks about other selves. Uh, in, indeed, in many suttas, uh, talk explicitly about a self and the importance of uh, keeping yourself up and, and, and striving to make yourself better and all these other things that I think many of us will be familiar with from the early texts. But then he says in certain suttas, that these are only these should be only understood as certain expressions. They don't. They have to be understood without grasping them. With while we understand them, as, to, as supposed to be taken in a certain way. That is to say, they're true in a manner of speaking, but not in some deep level. It's sort of like it's okay to talk about uh, a mirage that we might uh, think we see or a hallucination that we might think we see. We may discuss that without believing that therefore we're, we're talking about something real. 
uh, we're we're saying we're speaking about something that we we understand is not real, but we we can nevertheless use the expression to get across what we're trying to the, the points that we're trying to make. And in these early texts, really the only uh, concepts that are said to be uh, uh, problematic in this way are concepts about the self. Uh, for example, uh, will I exist in the future? Will there be a self that's me in the future? Will be, there be a self? Uh, was there a self that was me in the past? These kinds of ideas of a, of a permanent or continuing self over time, uh, of, an, of an eternal self, these are the sorts of things that are misleading when we use terms like self, and so we have to be careful with the language. We might say that there are two levels of truth. There's the conventional level in which there are selves, there's a me, there's a you, uh, and we understand that, uh, that uh, we can use these terms uh, because they are useful in certain circumstances, but there's a deeper level in which these selves are a kind of an illusion, that they don't persist, that they're always changing. And so that when we make use of concepts like self, we're only making use of them at a sort of superficial level. But if this is at a superficial level, what's the deeper level? Uh, the deeper level, I mean, I've, I've been getting at it a bit here, uh, but we should keep in mind that the Buddha never really talks about there being an ultimate truth. He never t talks about there being a deepest level or an ultimate level of truth. That's something that will come uh, in time and we'll get to that uh, later on. Uh, but in any event, w what he does do is to differentiate between correct ways of seeing and incorrect ways of seeing. A ways of seeing that we might say are conventionally true and ones that are, have, a, have a deeper truth to them. Uh, so for example, uh, the Buddha talks about uh, the fact that we see certain things as being beautiful. We see certain things as being happiness for us. But, he says, at a deeper level, we have to understand that nothing is truly beautiful because all things are, in a sense, unsatisfactory. That is, the beauty that they have is temporary. Similarly, uh, no nothing is truly happiness for us for the same reason, because all, all of our happiness is only temporary. It will eventually go away. It's not a secure refuge for us. So, we have to be able to let it go. So conventionally, yes, certain things are happy, certain things are beautiful. But on a deeper level, nothing is really happy or beautiful because all things change. Right view, therefore, is to understand, is to see this deeper truth that all things are changeable, that all things are, in a sense, unsatisfactory because they're changeable, because they're not secure refuges, and that all things are non-self. That however you understand yourself to be, you can't identify yourself with anything in the world, anything that you see around you, because things again are always changing. Nothing is under our ultimate control. And it's that deeper sense that then we might say is the, the deeper truth here. And as there are no permanent selves, as all selves are always changing, what are we left with? What is the deeper truth when we uh, get away from this idea of self, or begin to understand that this idea of self that we have is really only convention. Well, the deeper truth is that what there are are these five aggregates. Now, I've discussed those in some detail in a recent video. I'll leave a link to that video down below in the show notes in case you want to know more about these five aggregates. But very, very roughly, they are a series of five kinds of events that come and go, physical and mental events that make up what we take to be a person. Uh, that is, uh, changing things in the body, uh, changing perceptions, changing states of consciousness, uh, changing volitions, that is to say, uh, desires to do certain kinds of things, and so on and so forth. All of these are the deeper reality uh, that exists uh, sort of behind our conventions. Now, our conventions don't quite go there. We don't understand these things conventionally. These are theoretical uh, constructs that the Buddha comes up with to say this is what really, uh, this is the deeper truth here. So when the, the knowledgeable person talks about selves, they use the word self, as the Buddha says, without misapprehending it. They use it while understanding that the, the, the deeper reality is, that, is one of change of these five aggregates. And indeed, the deeper reality involves what are known as the three marks of existence. And I also did a video on that, which I'll leave a link to down below in the notes. 
the three marks of existence being the ones we've uh, just been discussing, in fact, uh, that all reality is changeable, that all reality is in a sense unsatisfactory, that it does not provide us a secure refuge, and third, that all of reality is non-self. So, and again, in a sense, we have these two levels to truth, the conventional truth of everyday life, where we have uh, objects and things and persons, and the deeper truth, where uh, I should also say the conventional truth involves that things are happy and that things are uh, 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 pleasant for us and that things are beautiful. And the deeper truth is that while those may be true at it for a time, uh, they aren't ultimately true, that uh, happiness is something that exists but passes away, uh, and so on and so forth. And in this way, we have, in a sense, two levels to truth, the conventional reality that we all live in, but that trips us up, and the deeper truth, the deeper reality, which is one that we learn through meditative insight and the like. Now, those of us who are familiar with the Buddhist notion of two truths will probably say this is quite different from what we're taught later on, what we're taught about the two truths in later Buddhism, and indeed it is, because these later ideas are developments out of the, the ideas that we find in early Buddhism. So in the next video, I'll get into how this changed, how we got from uh, the Buddha's ideas of, as, we, as it were, two levels to truth, to a more sophisticated understanding of the same idea of two truths. And when that video is ready, I'll put a link to it up here on the screen. Thanks so much for checking us all out. If you're getting something out of these videos, take a look at my Patreon page and see if you want to join us. And meanwhile, be well.